On today's episode, a Texan bodies a Kiwi, and a stolen Arca car is found. Plus, Alex Polo is just really good at any car. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. My name is Matt. What you guys didn't see is me nearly fall down the stairs when I went running downstairs real quick to get something to show all of you. So, I bid on a few things that this General Mills auction was having. They were having a surplus sale. They had some NASCAR stuff that existed in there. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to bid on some of this, right? It's cool to have it. What I maybe didn't understand is just how much came with these lots that I bid on. So I was the winner of two different lots, and I'm going to show you guys what I got. We're going to start with um, the first item which happens to be the number 43 John Andretti pop secret with the king um Pontiac Grand Prix one Grand Prix not Grand Prix who are we talking about here 164 scale that's nice right yeah I got one of those yeah well I've got about I don't know a hundred of them at this point so yeah I'm gonna have to find some people to give these away to because I can't just have that many not to be outdone though I also bid on another lot, and it was these Johnny Benson plush toys, the number 26 Cheerios car when he had, drove for uh, Roush Racing back in the day. Again, maybe underestimated just how many came in it because I've got about um, four dozen of them at this point. This is a mess. I'm gonna have to clean that up. So yeah, I think we're gonna have to do some giveaways on the channel at some point. And uh, if you win, you're gonna get a Johnny Vincent plush toy plus a John Andretti uh, 164 scale car, or you're gonna have to find me at a racetrack so I can give these away because I got more than I expected at this point. So let me know in the comments what I should do with all of these. I'm gonna have to clean them up after this episode is over, but let's get into what happened this weekend on track for the NASCAR series. The NASCAR Cup Series and NASCAR Xfinity Series in action in Watkins Glen. Uh, trucks were off, which is fine. I actually kind of like the trucks at Watkins Glen. I know some truckers didn't, they have to move it around. Regardless, next year's truck schedule with the road courses is going to be wildly entertaining. For now though, the Xfinity race on Saturday. Obviously, the biggest story coming out of Saturday in the Xfinity series will be Connor Zilich becoming the Ty Gibbs of the NASCAR Xfinity series and winning in his first ever start, becomes the second youngest winner. Uh, who beat him? Joey Logano. Of course, it was Joey Logano. I believe that even happened at Kentucky, maybe. I'll have to double check that, but I'm not checking on the fly because why would you fact check while you're actually doing something? Uh, in this situation, though, Connor Zilch goes on to win the race, led 45 of the 90 laps. Absolutely stellar showing from him. What I didn't like about what happened on Saturday was how that race devolved into basically half of idiocracy at the end of it, and people were just running over each other, wrecks happening everywhere, laying a ton of fluid down on the racetrack, having to have a 23 minute red flag period all of it was just such a bummer for what had been up to that point a pretty good race Zilich of course had to come back through the field after getting sent to the back when he and Ty Gibbs as well as Sam Mayer shortcut the course and drove through the bus stop instead of on the actual track in the bus stop and that was not smart I don't know what they were thinking in that situation but NASCAR was like yeah dude you guys got to go to the back Ty Gibbs of course did not rebound he had an issue as well um, but for Connor Zilich huge showing for him huge showing for that junior motorsports team uh lived up to the hype i think that that was probably the biggest thing coming into the weekend that he was probably concerned about it was like man everybody's expecting me to win and he did go out there and do just that he won obviously he made his first truck start earlier in the year um at coda driving that spire number seven qualified on pole set a track record blew the first corner and then had a rebound to a fourth place finish did not have to worry about that on saturday well did get a penalty but was able to rebound and make it to the end stretch his fuel and it all worked out for him but man just how many accidents you had at the end of that race um even on the last lap when riley herbst gets turned and just all chaos ensues it's like dang and sheldon creed for the 12th time in his xfinity series career finishes second brutal for him maybe he'll eventually win it maybe he's just going to become the daniel hemrick of the xfinity series at this point and uh win a championship and his first race all in the same time only time will tell moving on to the or the cup series real quick as well i posted videos recapping both of these races so if you want full recaps go ahead and go watch those um from saturday and sunday 
Also, if you like the content that you see in video form on YouTube and TikTok, you might be interested in seeing what I have in written form. I do have a blog up and running now. You can check the link in the bio as well. Uh, it's on Substack. You don't have to pledge any money. It's free. Don't pay attention if you get a little pop-up that asks you about that. But yeah, read it, check it out. I'm planning on posting a couple times a week. Uh, just another outlet for, for my brand. Evening. But in the cup race, of course, Chris Buescher ends up coming out victorious over Shane Van Gisbergen, which that's a wild statement to begin with. And SVG making a self-induced mistake, clipping that uh, inside arm code, getting, getting into the bus stop there, mess up his whole line through that uh, section, allow Buescher to get up alongside of him going into the carousel. Buescher kind of put a door to him. All's fair in racing. Rubbing is racing, right? That's what it comes down to. Regardless of what Richard Childers says, NASCAR says you can't make contact on the last lap anymore. You can make contact. They never said you couldn't. What you can't do is just drive through two different cars on your way to victory. Chris Buescher did not do that. He and SVG had a great race. SVG, SVG got out of the car afterwards, was bummed, kicking himself. He should have won his second ever NASCAR Cup Series start. Uh, he said he was concerned about the 17 getting back to him. That's why he was trying to carry so much speed through the bus stop. Ultimately, probably didn't need to do that. Busher's not that type of driver, uh, a guy that's typically not going to wreck somebody as well. But Busher's been good on road courses, hasn't had a win in the Cup Series up to this point, but has won in the Xfinity Series on a road course and got that W on Sunday. Um, at Watkins Glen for he and that team. First time since 2013 that Roush Fenway Keselowski Racing has had two cars visit Victory Lane in the same season. Uh, Brad obviously won back at Darlington earlier in the year. So that's a great result for them, especially for a guy that should have been in the playoffs if it wasn't for the gimmicky win and you're in uh, format. So for Busher, yeah, it sucks that he's not in the playoffs, but hey, he at least showed that he belongs there for SVG. He was bummed, went down, congratulated Busher, uh, was smiling afterwards. Dude 100% gets it. Breath of fresh air. It's great that NASCAR has him. I'm glad that he's embraced it. The fans love him. He seems to really enjoy the interaction with the fans as well. So pumped that he's going full time in the Cup Series next season. Uh, one of the talking points coming out of this weekend is should there be single file restarts, especially, you know, during green, white checker. I... I get why people like double file restarts. Don't get me wrong. I would argue that it might be worth experimenting with to see if it cuts down on the number of incidents that we have because it definitely creates more incidents, right? You get a caution at the end of this race and you're like, well, there's probably going to be another wreck um, in here. And it's, it sucks because it drags the race out so much longer. Um, the other talking point as well is like, hey, should we have green, white checker finishes? Do we even need overtime? This was the 12th overtime this season for the Cup Series. And overtime is supposed to be like this special thing, right? Like it doesn't happen every week. Like if every game in the NFL went to overtime or every game in MLB went to extra innings, people are like, this is kind of stupid at this point. Like, why do we keep doing this? And now we've had, what, 12 of our 28 races so far this season go to overtime just feels like a lot and i've always been a person that's like respect the race distance if it says 400 miles we end at 400 miles if it says 500 miles we end at 500 miles or 500 laps or whatever you know iteration and track we're at just in the race there been a big proponent of that i know it's not a popular opinion i know people in the comments are going to say which is totally fine i'm here for the discourse um but it definitely saves people from wrecking a lot of race cars it saves people from potentially getting hurt and it doesn't allow them to let themselves look like fools right and martin Trucks jr basically alluded to the fact that they all look like fools out there on sunday and that's why he's out of here which i get he's frustrated he is not happy at all he's sitting in a precarious spot going into um bristol next weekend denny hamlin Bad day at the track on Sunday, sitting six points below the cutoff. He's won the last two races at Bristol. I'm not too worried about him making it into the playoffs. Uh, Ty Gibbs, Chase Briscoe, those are probably the two guys I would be concerned about falling out. Brad Keselowski's 12 points below the cutoff. Uh, he, I think, has a good chance to get back in. I think Truex is 14 points below. Harrison Burton's 20 points below. I think Harrison and Truex are just done. I just don't think they have it in them. Truex uh, just seems pretty defeated. And Burton, I just don't think they'll have speed. Uh, this weekend at Bristol. But overall, I really like the racing this weekend. Uh, won't be a playoff race next year for the Cup Series. Not that upset about it, other than the fact that like we have to have Gateway and New Hampshire both in the first two rounds. That kind of sucks. Not really looking forward to that. But Watkins Glen absolutely delivered, and maybe it's one and only playoff race. Before we get into our voicemails, we have one of the wilder stories I think we're going to see this year. And that is because someone named what Mo Tolan posted on Facebook uh, uh, over the weekend, hey, anybody missing a race car with a photo of Will Kimmel's number 69 sitting on the side of the road on what appears to be some sort of country road in northern Illinois next to a cornfield. And yeah, it's just Arca. That's just exactly what this is. It's Arca. When you see it, you're like, 
Yeah, that's Arca. Zero surprise for me to be like, oh yeah, of course there would be a stolen Arca car sitting half cocked in the road next to a cornfield in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. Of course it is, it's Arca. That's always going to happen. It's either Arca or Team Extreme in the NASCAR series. Uh, they're one and the same, essentially. So what appears to happen here is Roger Carter uh, was in possession of this car and then it was reported stolen potentially by him as well as an engine, a seat, probably a fuel cell as well, some other stuff. He was supposed to build the race car doesn't appear that that happened because it's sitting uh, on a country road next to a cornfield. And yeah, Will Kimmel will probably get this 69 nice car back, get it back together and have it back on track. Uh, maybe at the end of this year, maybe next year, maybe it'll even jump out of a racetrack and hit a car in the parking lot at this point. But of course, it was an Arca car that this happened to just an all around like, yeah, that makes sense. It's Arca. Not shocked by it, but also hilarious moment at the same time. All right, moving into our new segment, the voicemail, the power hour, the hotline, whatever you would like to refer to it as. We had more calls this week. I appreciate everybody calling in. If you want to call in and leave me a voicemail, 513-445-9809. Some people called in last week after I had recorded uh, the show. Um, I don't think I got all the calls in for this week. If you do call this week now to lead up, I will make sure that you make it into the next episode next week, or maybe we'll even do a midweek episode as well. But for now, let's get into them. Hey, my name's Dylan from Virginia. What your opinion on uh, Rick Hendrick's comment? Yeah, he said that he would expect NASCAR to make any charter uh, changes that 2311 a front row um, deal with NASCAR, you would expect them to uh, have the same deal. <clears throat> do you agree with that? Or do you agree? Do you think that he should have, you know, held out and he should have waited until he got a better deal? I'd love to know your thoughts. Thank you. All right. Thank you for calling in Dylan from Virginia. So his question was about whether or not um, if NASCAR makes concessions to 2311 Racing and Front Row, that should go to the other 13 teams that have already signed that charter agreement. And yeah, I think it should have to at this point. And it would be very interesting if it did happen, what those other 13 teams would do, because then there could be actual legal action that went against NASCAR and 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports. But ultimately, if you think they're going to get something that you didn't, maybe you shouldn't have signed as well. So it's a real toss up at this point in the sense of fairness. Yeah, I think they should get that. 2311 Racing ultimately is not going to get what they want out of this. They may get some small minor concessions, but they're not getting what their ultimate goal was here. And I think that's why everybody else had signed. So whatever little concessions they do get, I would imagine that everybody else will get as well if they get them. It still remains to be seen. NASCAR and 2311 Racing have not spoken. Then he said, we're not really sure what the next path for us is right now. So yeah, the next eight weeks are once again, probably going to be a standoff. Hey, Matt, it's Cito Brown calling from Los Angeles, California. I got to say, this Watkins Glen race was something to remember, definitely, from start to finish, from strategy, especially the ending. And my question for this race was, was Busher's move to SVG a fair move, in your opinion? Because SVG moved Busher on the initial restart, and Busher committed after SVG tried to cut him off coming into the, into the carousel after he made his mistake in the bus stop on the last lap. Any thoughts? Thank you. All right. Thanks for calling in, Tito. So obviously there was a lot of contact that was made there on the last lap. Do I think it was fair? Absolutely. Um, I said in my recap video that, you know, SVG got down in the corner on the restart, gave Busher a little bit of a bump so that he was able to clear him um, on that restart, the final restart. And then Busher gets back to him, put the door to him. SVG, of course, was trying to cut him off because obviously he's got to try to make his car as wide as possible here. But that's racing. It's quintessential NASCAR. It's banging doors. It's trading paint. Have absolutely zero issue with that and i think both drivers had zero issue with how both of them were raced i think it was fair it was clean racing in the sense that like neither got taken out it is you are capable of racing people making contact and not destroying race cars and i was happy to see that on sunday hi this is maddie from north carolina and i just wanted to say i really enjoyed the race i thought it was a nice change of pace especially after last week when we had two winners who looked like they corned the long way I really think that having two feel-good winners uh, the next weekend afterwards was a nice change of pace. 
And I hope that the road course package continues to improve. Thanks for calling in, Maddie. <laughs> Saying that the last two winners of the regular season eat corn the long way is a pretty funny line. Uh, I completely understand where you're coming from with that. And having two feel good winners the last two weeks is actually pretty refreshing as well. Is Logano a feel good winner? Maybe if you're a Logano fan for sure, or his dad or his wife or kids. I'm not sure if the rest of the fan base would agree with that. Um, but it is nice to have two different winners. Basically, we've, we've had four different winners now um, in the last four weeks, which is fun. fun. It's parody, um, everything that goes along with that. Yes, I hope the road course package continues to improve. Um, we got rid of the Fred Flintstone specials that we had on the car. We got a tire that wears, but it didn't really wear as much as we were hoping for, which is a bit of a bummer. Uh, so my name's Ryan. Um, so I'm from Perry, and today's race was actually pretty wild. Um, I was watching Shane Van Gisbergen, or SVG. Um, I was on the track, and... Dominating that second place spot all day long. Um, and then we had Ross Chastain winning both race, uh, sorry, stages. Um, pretty cool for that. Um, I'm questioning how William Byron almost went over the catch fencing. Um, sorry, not catch fencing, but over the fence. But, but Kislowski had a really bad day. It, that was horrible for him. So, hopefully at Bristol, he has a better race. Um, Austin Sinjic, he did okay, not bad, but, um, uh, I forgot who won the IndyCar race, but I, I love your videos. All right. appreciate that. Ryan calling in from Perry. I don't know where Perry is at. It sounds maybe like California. I'm not hundred percent sure there, but appreciate you calling in. Appreciate the nice words at the end there about liking the videos as well. Uh, yeah, William Byron and Brad Kozlowski made contact, sent Byron up in the air. He hits the Armco. Thankfully the Armco is like double height right there and kept him out of the fence because we would have been there for a long time with some fence repair. Uh, Jeff Gluck was concerned that William Byron would have gone out of the racetrack. Jeff Gluck is concerned about the weirdest things like Last year at Talladega, when he was really happy that we didn't have a car flip over the fence into the infield, like, just relax, dude. That wasn't going to happen. The catch fence is there. It would have done its job. William Byron would not have left the racetrack. Just would have been a lengthy repair to get that fence back up. Uh, just really one of those Hawaiian pretzel bites. I completely understand it. Somebody said they're good, so I guess I'm going to go to Kroger and buy them so I can try them out. But thanks for calling in, Ryan. What's up, Ray Card? It's uh, Carl calling here from Chicago. I was just calling to uh, say that I'm excited to go to the Bristol Night Race again this year. I was wondering what your uh, what your opinions are, because I believe they're supposed to be bringing the same tire compound that they brought to the spring race there, which obviously we saw a lot of tire degradation, but supposedly that was the same tire compound they had brought the previous year in 23 for the uh, for the night race. So I was curious if you think it'll be more like the spring race or similar to last year's night race um, in terms of tire degradation and everything like that. Yeah, thanks for calling in, Carl. His question was about the tires, and NASCAR is bringing the same tire compound to Bristol for the night race this weekend on Saturday that they had back in the spring. They did a tire test earlier this summer when the ambient air temperature was around 90 degrees, and they had the same issue with the tires. So it appears to be the resin that's put down on the racetrack helps cause the issue with the tires. I would expect something similar. NASCAR did say uh, today, on Monday, that they will be giving teams 45 minutes of practice uh, this weekend to get a handle on the tires to understand how the tires are wearing, which should make for an interesting Bristol night race. It's going to be an absolute crapshoot. I don't think it's going to be as dramatic as we saw back in the, th in the spring. I think teams will have a better understanding of it at this point, but it does appear that we could be headed towards another really, really interesting tire wear race at this point, maybe going a little bit longer. They'll probably have a better handle on it, but it should be should be interesting. Hey, it's John from Florida. The green white trucker situation, at least with the Xfinity race, got pretty ridiculous again. And I'd really like to see a one attempt limit or just set a red flag flat with like three or four to go, depending on the track, and just be done with it. It's getting pretty ridiculous to see everything get extended like that and the it was kind of ironic to see the Xfinity race be as long as the originally scheduled cup race there. The Xfinity race, I think they went 90 laps, and that's the length of the cup race, too, before that got extended there. So 
race. But thanks for calling in, John. Yeah, he's correct. The Xfinity race went 90 laps on Saturday, which is the distance of the cup race as well, which also went to overtime. So it went beyond its 90 laps. Uh, I don't disagree with the idea of maybe it's time to try out single file restarts maybe only one attempt at a green white checker i actually would be fine with that as well um john also mentions like having a set lap number for them to throw a red flag uh you know like if there's a caution that happens with three to go. They red flag the race. That way you still get your two laps at the end of the race there as well. Uh, kind of like what IndyCar did at the Indy 500 when they did an unprecedented move back in 2023 with that when Marcus Erickson was leading. Then ultimately Joseph Newgarden goes on to win that race. Controversial finish as well. So yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think it might be worth a try because sometimes these races do continue to devolve and just to absolute chaos. And it's not fair to the team owners and some of the drivers it's not fair to like... In this situation, if Connor Zilich had just gotten absolutely dumped and it's like all he did all day was the right thing, dominated this race. And then unfortunately, because Matt Benedetto stops in the bus stop, he gets junked like that doesn't seem entirely fair um, at this point. Same thing that happened on the cup race, like when Harrison Burton blows that tire, Chris Busch is like, dang it. Now I have to race SVG uh, this entire time and then go to the overtime and everything like that. So I think it's worth having a discussion about. What's up, cards? This is Tim from Wisconsin, the second time recording. Um... I want to talk about IndyCar, how they said that they want to go to tracks that they've never been to before. But yet, for the last three races of the season, including Milwaukee and Nashville, that that's where they've been to in the past. And it just doesn't make sense to me. I was to both Milwaukee races, me, my wife, and my friends, and it was just absolutely incredible. But don't get me wrong, it was an amazing, but him saying those comments really kind of killed the vibe for me and i'm just curious what your thoughts of him saying that things and yet they're going to all of these racetracks all right thanks for calling in tim so tim's question was actually a two-parter uh it was about a minute and a half long there so i had already his second part of his question was about 2311 racing and you know what that kind of future holds for them should they take nascar to court how's that all going to play out there kind of answered that a uh, few calls back so i'll just revert back to what i had said there for that tim but then his other question about indycar talking about how they want to go to new racetracks they don't want to go back to tracks that they've been to but yet they continue to go back to tracks that they've been to which is very funny and mark miles was completely oblivious to the fact that like they went back to milwaukee they went back to nashville super speedway now and tim's right like indycar does all this talking about you know wanting to go to new markets wanting to do this we're not going back to be the old indycar and they're continually being the old indycar at this point milwaukee looked like a great time so i'm glad tim and his wife and friends had a fun time over there because both of those races were highly entertaining and i did not expect them to be at all so hand up on my part there but IndyCar talks about, you know, potentially announcing a new race by the end of the 2024 calendar year. Uh, will that happen? I have my doubts about it. It'll likely be Dallas or a street race in San Antonio, somewhere in that area. They've had conversations with Denver about maybe having a race there. Um, they would like to get into other markets out west, up in the northeast. But this is what IndyCar does. They continually talk about wanting to do these things. And I think they should. They should absolutely do it. Uh, but to say that we're not going back to tracks that we've been to, that's stupid because there's certainly some tracks that they absolutely should go back to, which produce highly entertaining races. They're just not very good at promoting them specifically around ovals. Like the IndyCar championship race at Nashville should have been a much bigger deal than it was. And don't get me wrong. The grandstand looked all right. It looked like it had a decent amount of people in there, but I mean, it looked more like a NASCAR Cindy series crowd. And this is like for the championship race. So yeah, they just need to do a better job all around at promoting that series. But Hey, maybe they'll eventually announce another new race at some point in the future, but probably not. Hey, Matt, it's Nathan from Indiana. Uh, I'm going to say, like, I enjoyed the uh, Xfinity race. I'm happy for Connor Zilich, and also I I think Sheldon Creed is the new Daniel Hemrick of Xfinity. And, I mean, I just, I thought of this weird dream of, like, if he actually won the championship this season without winning a single race or if it happens to be his first win. Like, I just had a dream about that for some reason. But uh, anyways, I, I like your channel and uh, take care. Thanks for calling in, Jason. Appreciate the kind words there at the end. Listen, 
if Sheldon Creed is just basically Daniel Hemrick reincarnated in the Xfinity series and he wins a championship without winning a race, pulls a Matt Crafton in the truck series, that would be wild. Going against everything NASCAR wants out of this format and then ultimately winning the title would be very funny at this point. But eventually Sheldon has to win, right? Like, I mean, well, I say that the Buffalo Bills still have never won a Super Bowl and they make it there and then they fail and then don't win at that. So maybe they will never win an actual Maybe he will never win an actual race, but maybe he will. He is, of course, going to Haas Factory next year. Maybe he'll have a better shot with them. But man, it would be nice to see Sheldon Creed just win one time, just to get that monkey off his back. Like like Corey LaJoy finally getting a top 10 on a non-drafting track. We don't have to talk about that anymore. If Sheldon can just win a race, we don't have to talk about his 12 second place finishes anymore either. All right, thanks to everybody that called in. If you want to call in and leave me a voicemail, 513-445-9809 to do that. I'll include it maybe on a video this week if there's enough that come in, but definitely try to get you guys worked in next week's episode as well. We also had a weird incident this weekend that involved Matt Tift, former NASCAR Cup Series driver, former NASCAR Cindy Series driver, Matt Tift, where he was racing in the ASA series up at Toledo, he got taken out by Billy Vandermeer. And after the race, he walked down there to have a civil conversation. Uh, Matt Tift was mic'd up. He was recording himself from a distance, not walking in there with a camera or anything like that. And as soon as he walked in there, he immediately gets assaulted, gets grabbed. They told him that he came to the wrong place. They punched him. They forced him to the ground. And then somebody kicks him in the face. Not great. That is actually a felony. So don't do do not do that. Tift at, in the moment did not press any charges. But then on Monday morning, he posted a video of him walking around his neighborhood. His face is messed up. It's not good. It looks better than Matheson's face from Pineapple Express, but it still is definitely been beat up. He's got a black eye. His face is swollen. Not great. And he's talking about uh, he thinks he's going to press charges now, which he absolutely should. There's no, sp there's no place for this in the sport. I'm so tired of short track guys giving racing a bad name. It makes it look like it's a bunch of hillbillies out here. They're trying to beat the crap out of each other every single weekend. That's not racing. You want to race, go out there and race. You have a, fr you are mad. You're frustrated. Okay. You deal with that on your own. You don't just tackle a guy to the ground, kick him in the face. And that guy wasn't even the race car. That was a crew guy who should be banned from ASA for life, should be banned from that racetrack for life. They won't do it because they don't have the balls to do that, but he absolutely should. No spot, no place in the sport for that type of behavior. I absolutely hate when we see videos like that. And I hate that it gets brushed off and people like are just like, oh, that's just how it is. You know, that's short track racing. No, it's not. That's assault. You should not be able to do that. I don't care if that's what it used to be back in the 70s and the 80s. Doesn't matter anymore. You cannot take a guy to the ground and kick him in the face. That is against the law. All right, and to wrap up the episode this week, looking ahead, what is on television this week? Well, on Thursday night at 5 p.m., we have the ARCA series from Bristol. Corey Day will be in that race, making his third ever start on pavement. At 8 o'clock on um, FS1, you have the truck series race Thursday night from Bristol as well, going head-to-head -head against Thursday night football. Corey Day making his first ever NASCAR truck series start in that race, driving the number 81 car for MHR, um, which... Obviously, he'll be in the 91, a couple other races this year. Teammates to Christian Eck is Daniel Dye uh, as well in that series. So that'll be interesting to see. On Friday night, you have the Xfinity Series on the CW. On the CW, not on USA, not on NBC, the CW. They start their coverage uh, for the final eight races of the Xfinity Series season and also obviously next year and into the future as well. And then on Saturday night, of course, we have the Bristol night race. Sunday, you have the Formula One Singapore Grand Prix as well. IndyCar is done for the season. So let me know in the comments what you thought about all the racing this weekend, um, whether Matt Tiff should you know press charges or not, the stolen ARCA car, the voicemails, everything. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.